So, uh, final talk of the day, um, and this is the other kind of modelling, the one that one hears a lot about these days, large language models, GPT-3 in this case, and uh, can it help you with your type error debugging? Francisco, thank you. Okay, so can you, everyone hear me? Okay, so I'm the intruder that got into a modelling session without a modelling paper. Uh, so I guess the models keyword there fooled the segmentation algorithm that distributed our presentations. So, um, hello everyone, my name is Francisco Ribeiro. I'm a PhD student at the University of Minho in Portugal, and I work on fault localization and automated program repair. So, and I'm here to present our paper with the title GPT-3 Powered Type Error Debugging, Investigating the Use of Large Language Models for Code Repair. A rather long title, but that's what ChatGPT told me I should name my paper, so I didn't even question it. Uh, which describes a work done in collaboration between the University of Minho and the University of Porto, both in Portugal and NII in Japan. Okay, so to begin with, let's briefly talk about what a type system is. Uh, programming languages usually have a type system, and these assign types to terms in a program. Uh, type systems also determine if some operation can be applied to some term in a program. And this way, type systems ensure a uh, program's correctness regarding type safety. So that is, if a program does not type check, then there's a logical error re related to the type constraints. And here is a very simple example just to showcase what, what we are talking about. Um, so adding one and two makes sense. It works, that's three. Adding one to a string word the, does not work. That is, it does not type check, and so we get an error. Specifically, we get a type error. And notice that the message uh, mentions some types here, uh, and that's because we can also have uh, type inference systems that compute expected types. Uh, furthermore, uh, compilers also try to locate the fault. They try to tell us where the, the error is. However, compilers often fail to pinpoint the true cause of the error, and that's the motivation uh, for, for this work. Uh, this is an example of a recursive function in OCaml, so this is the part where my supervisor turns away because he has to look at OCaml, and uh, I can't because I'm presenting, and it's the add list function, and it takes a list of integers and should calculate the sum of all numbers. Uh, there is some pattern matching going on regarding the input list, if the list is empty, an empty list is returned. Otherwise, we add the current element to the recursive uh, call on the list's uh, tail. So indeed, the compiler detects an error and provides a message about it highlighting the problematic part of the program. It does not know how to add something of type list of the sum A. Uh, replacing the plus operator with the cons operator, which inserts an element to the beginning of a list, in fact, makes this program well-typed. Uh, but this is not the true origin of the error. The message we get about mismatching types does not guide us directly towards the, the issue. Another way we have to fix this type error that actually corresponds to the programmer's intended fix is to replace the empty list with zero. And by doing that, we have a well-typed program as well things to take away from this. So the intended modification can be different from what the compiler reports about. The order of expressions influences the reporting of type inconsistencies, and that is because as long as no inconsistencies are detected, expressions are considered correct. Uh, in other words, uh, type systems have a left to right bias, which tends to make errors show up towards the end of a program. And notice that swapping the, the two patterns changes the reported expression, which essentially means there are multiple causes for this uh, error, this type error. So what is our work? Well, even after recognizing these limitations, we still have to fix the, the error. That is, even if we know uh, what part of the program uh, was faulty, we still had to come up with the change for it. And automated program repair aims to fix programs with as little uh, human intervention as possible. 
And that is where we focus on automatically finding repairs uh, for type errors. Because we argue that doing that is an effective way of locating them and understanding them. So the way we do this is by analyzing and manipulating the source code of ill type uh, programs to generate something called prompts or inputs that are then provided to GPT-3 so that we can leverage the model's code understanding and code generation capabilities. And our aim is to produce programs that are not only free from type errors, but also correct according to the original uh, intent. We shall see how we, we also work on this. Uh, so just to make it clear, uh, this is where we focus on that highlighted part uh, in red. The main idea is that good quality prompts provide good quality generations. So therefore, efforts should be placed on building the best possible prompts. So models are not magic. So we need to actually make some effort into giving them good inputs so they can give us good outputs, good results. What is our technique? So for an OCaml program with a type error, we extract as much information as possible from it, and we format that information to build good quality prompts for GPT-3 in this case. And to do this, we perform three tasks on the source code. Uh, type error location, inlining, and type unification. Okay, a lot going on here. Uh, OCaml provides a function called magic in the OBJ module, uh, which has type A to B. And when you see A with the, and B with those apostrophes, it's a, a way to have a polymorphic type in OCaml. Uh, and that magic function uh, converts a value of any type into a value of any type. So in other words, we trick the compiler into assuming an expression of one type has, in fact, a different type. If you hear me talking about typecasting something, it means applying this magic function to something. I may use those interchangeably. And if we recall the introductory example, and the two places, we try to modify the, um, to, to fix the type error in the add list function. When we apply magic to the empty list, that first listing there, it, get, it gets converted to a polymorphic B, and the compiler deduces this to be int. On the other hand, we can also apply, uh, we can also apply the magic function to the plus operator, and the compiler deduces this to be a function with type uh, A to list of A to list of A. What is important to retain here is that every application of magic, the, this magic function, uh, that makes the program type check is a candidate for, the, for type error location. And in this example, the first two would be candidates because they type check, and the third one would not be a candidate because even though we apply magic, uh, there's still a type error in the program, so we don't consider it to be a candidate to, to, to fix. The second task is inlining. Uh, we make use of inlining not for the usual purposes of compiler optimizations, but to be able to make information available from some parts of the program in other places. Uh, this program here uh, applies operators that are incompatible. It's a very simple illustrative, illustrative program. Uh, it adds x to itself, and it also applies a logical end, but in prefix notation. Um, and if we consider this program, which has a type error, and we typecast this expression, that is, we apply magic to that logical end, the type error goes away and the intended type for that specific part uh, ends up being int, int to a. Uh, however, if we extend the program with a very simple test case, f1 equals 3, uh, we inline that usage of f, we associate it to a different context in which the type system knows more things, has more information, knows that int there. And if we perform type inference on that second occurrence of f that we just inlined, we get a more specific type. And that way we can get more specific information about possible types. And we can build more useful prompts. That's what we want. We want extra information to be able to build useful prompts. And the last task is type unification. Uh, we can make use of type unification to filter elements uh, from a list of completion suggestions. 
basically we replaced the typecast uh, expressions with something called typed holes and we then ask for completion suggestions on these typed holes through um, so a typed hole is represented by that underscore, by the way, highlighted in orange. And uh, we, on these typed holes, we, um, through something called the OCaml LSP, which is a language server protocol, it's a technology many code editors use in the background. We use it programmatically, so you can interact with it programmatically. This is a, just for illustration purposes. Um, and we, we ask a, a list of suggestions for that typed hole through OCaml LSP. And we also perform something called type inference on these type holes. And what we then do is that we apply type unification between that inferred type and each suggestion in the list. Uh, because these suggestions do not necessarily match the expected type. And in this particular example, we are able to reduce a list of 318 suggestions to 23, because the majority of them didn't actually fit the, the, the type that was expected there. And based on everything we talked about so far, we implemented several repair strategies. This is the part where our approach actually tries to build patches that will fix type errors. And the simplest one, we, one is called fill, we, we called it fill. And what we do is each time we detect a candidate location for repair, that is when, we, when using the magic function makes the program type check, we just replace that expression with an insert tag. This is the simplest approach. We then make use of uh, GPT-3's insert mode that, that exists is available through an API and we ask for a completion. So in this case it's actually able to just put the, the zero there which is actually what we, we, we want. Simplest one. But, uh, and we also developed some more elaborate repair strategies. This one is called choose and it formats the, actually perhaps the most curious one, it actually formats the input candidate program as an exercise similar to what you may find in an exam, for example. So the template for the exercise is presented as the source code with, uh, with a missing hole denoted by the mask identifier and the list of possible solutions, which we, we obtained through that type unification task. And we then ask GPT-3 to select the most appropriate option, uh, but we guide the, the, the model into selecting one option through something called prompt engineering, which is actually really important because you will get a lot of unpredictable stuff if you don't do it. Uh, we do this by preceding uh, these prompts with two example exercises that share this template but are already solved. And laying down that structure helps the model understand that it should select one option and it will actually focus on just giving me the, the letter I want. In this specific example, the correct choice is not present, but it was a very good example to illustrate that there are some disadvantages with this and it was succinct enough to, to illustrate. And the last strategy that uses GPT-3 is called instruct. This uses something called an edit mode, and this is the most different from them all. Uh, it, it expects two things, two inputs, the prompt, and in separate instructions describing how to edit the prompt. And we perform uh, those inlining and type unification tasks on the Magify typecasted program in order to compute the minimal substitution for that expected type in the underscore. And we wish to see that hole filled in and the template we use for the instructions, there in the bottom of each uh, example, uh, the template we use for it is replace the underscore with something of type whatever was inferred. In the first case the inferred type is int and GPT-3 indeed responds with something of type int. It, it will fill in the zero there, uh, right, which I didn't put it here but it does. And the second one does not correspond to the, the candidate that will generate the, the fix, but it still serves to show some, something very important, which is creating adequate prompts is essential. Because in the, the second example, the inferred type is of a function, so uh, A to list of B to list of B. And if we submit this to the model, it, it, will, it will in fact answer back with a function. So it won't, in theory, it could completely disregard our instructions and just realize that it should place a zero like it did previously. But no, it actually takes our instructions really seriously. 
and it will try to actually place a function there. So th that actually shows that effort in building the prompts heavily influences what we get out from the models. We also implemented a, a completely offline strategy. That this was a, a, a consequence we did not predict, but it means we can actually skip interaction with GPT-3. This is not the focus of our work, but we, still, we will still briefly talk about it. After locating some candidate expression with that whole usage of the magic function, and you compute a list of suggestions, just like we did for that uh, repair strategy that tried to emulate a programming exercise, uh, choose. Uh, we, we actually try every computed alternative, and if it passes one or multiple provided test cases, we will simply report back to the user that uh, that this may fix your, your, your program. And to test our approach, we conducted a large-scale evaluation. Um, we used an existing independent and public repository, originally with 4,500 programs. And for each, we had a type error version and a fixed version. And we filtered out programs that needed multiple modifications in disjointed places. Uh, more on that afterwards, and programs for which the fixed version did not pass some quick check tests, and we shall also see that. So if the reported fixed version did not pass the, the 10,000 generated quick check tests, we assume that that is not a fixed version, so we also filtered those programs out. And with this, we end up with 1,318 programs to analyze. And our strategy to, before uh, getting on to the results, our strategy to validate the generated patches is fully automatic. And it is flexible to allow patches that are equivalent to the intended fix uh, without any human intervention. So for each patch, we instantiate the following template quick check property. Um, we provide the input signature of the function to implement, to, for quick check to implement, a, to, or rather to use uh, the appropriate generator, generate uh, the default value of 10,000 inputs. The output signature tells quick check how to compare results, and the property that should be ver verified is that the result of the original fixed version should be the same as the result of the patch that we are currently testing. And if this holds, the patch, the patch is considered equivalent to the fixed version, and thus we consider that that is a successful repair. So as we said, we analyzed 1,318 programs, 516 were completely fixed, and that's 39.2% of them, and 441 were partially fixed, which is a 33.5% rate. Partial fixes are patches that satisfied somewhere between 1% and 99% of test cases. Uh, this, is a, this actually allows us to explore the ground that separates a, a completely fixed program from a program that remains broken. It's interesting to see that th there are actually some amount of programs there. Another way to look at the data, so 361 programs remain unfixed, uh, with 247 of them erroring out, 73 had no patches generated, and 41 actually failed every, every single one of the 10,000 inputs that failed. So these were ex especially challenging bugs. And what we also notice is that it is more likely for a program to be completely fixed, which is those 516, or remain unfixed with 0% of test cases. So it's more likely that the program will fall into one of these categories. The, the, the partial fixes are... Uh, in a lesser quantity. We also analyzed the effectiveness of each repair strategy that we devised, the ones that use GPT-3. Uh, fill is the most effective one. It's also the simplest one, so sometimes simple is better. And followed by instruct and choose. Some programs are fixed by only one strategy, whereas some other programs are actually fixed by multiple ones. Uh, it's worth noting that although choose the, the, that smaller circle there is the least effective strategy, there are still 30 programs that are only fixed by it. So uh, we uh, then, for example, on the other hand, 24 programs are 
fixed by all the strategies. All the strategies can reach the intended fix. We also conducted a comparative study between our tool uh, called Mentat uh, and two other type prepared tools, ForoCamel, which are Write and Seminal. The three tools use a common data set and each apply its own pre-processing criteria. So as a consequence, the data set was filtered to 591 programs, which were the programs that were common to all three works. And out of these 591 bugs, our tool fixed, our tool is Mentat, it fixed 222, Write fixed 198, and Seminal fixed 46. And some of the insights we take from this are that Mentat surpasses existing state-of-the-art tools. We were able to fully validate results from Write, whereas initially the authors uh, reported a manual analysis of 21 programs. Passing tests is different than type repair. Tools normally have a higher rate of type repair. So for example, write reports at least 80% type repair accuracy. Our tool is also able to produce more patches that fix type errors. But when we consider test cases, these numbers go down, uh, which actually contradicts the informal saying in functional programming. That is, if it type checks, then it is correct. So it turns out GHC and OCaml C are lies. So. Um, we, and to, to finalize, we, we automatically validate all three uh, approaches. Our technique, Mentat, is based on a language agnostic approach. We wanted to focus on this uh, near the end. So uh, it, it has two requirements. We need to statically determine types of terms, either through type inference or annotations in the program. And the second requirement is that we need an ability to bypass the type system. So all that long and weird stuff about using a magic function and typecasting, which would be the equivalent to Haskell in with the undefined, um, it's just ability to bypass the type system. And moreover, using large language models, in this work we happen to, ch to use GPT-3 for patch generation trained on multiple languages uh, liberates us from building language specific uh, generation systems. And to finalize for future work, we would like to experiment with other uh, large language models, for example, GPT-4, but especially open source alternatives that are coming out and are uh, especially powerful like Llama 2 and Code Llama from Meta. Uh, we would like to expand this work for type errors with, uh, that need fixing in multiple locations, that need some restructuring of the technique. We, we focused on single location bugs, mostly single location bugs for now to validate all this. And we would also like to explore model fine tuning, either for OCaml, other languages, um, but especially specific contexts, like fine tuning models for program repair, for example. Um, and yeah, that's it, that's all I, I have to say uh, thank you, and please feel free to ask any questions. Excellent. Do we have any questions for Francisco? Buddy. Cool stuff. Um, so one of the things that uh, GPT is known for is confabulation, basically producing things that are totally believable they should be there probably, but they are not. Right? So for instance, referring to uh, I don't know a function that should have been there in the library, it's very sensible to expect it there in the library, mm -hmm. but it's not there. So it's in the generation, it's, it's not, it doesn't show up in the result. Uh, what result? Mm, yeah, uh, go on, I'm try still trying to understand the question. Well, you, you make a request to, uh, to GPT to uh, either through a chapter interface or the, w the way you are doing it, and you're saying, please give me the code, or fix this code. Okay, okay. And it fixes this code in a way that should have worked, but because the library has been not complete, or something is just not there. Right? Uh, have you encountered that in your setup, and how do you propose to deal with it? What we noticed is that uh Less context usually leads more to, we didn't specifically study that, so this is kind of informal observations, but we noticed that more context helps those situations uh, occur less times. Um, but yeah, there's always some degree of unpredictability to what could come out. 
-hmm. So yeah, if doing the this is wrong, fix it. Uh, usually, it's more likely for those things to happen than this is wrong. This is the message I got. These are the types I need. Some functions. It tends to happen less often. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Very, uh, very interesting work. Um, yeah, just kind of a comment. Uh, I guess you, you kind of touched on this in, in your future work, but yeah, I mean, w w it seems like what you're trying to get GPT-3 to do is basically a language modeling task, which I mean, LLMs are really good at, but it seems like kind of a roundabout way of going through a prompt asking it to fill in a, a mask token. It's like somewhere else you, you define, say, predict which of the following options. Um, I mean, I was curious if you looked into using a more specialized model that's like trained on OCaml code. I, in my experience, you can do pretty well at predicting type information and things just by training on like a corpus of a, a few million examples of code and not uh, having a LLM, but like a more specialized model, and just masking off and having it predict. Yes. Um, the main purpose of this work was to develop a technique that would be generalizable. So we, although we discussed it, we never had the intention of specializing in languages because we just used OCaml simply because the person supervising this work from the beginning just said, we're going to work with OCaml, and I used OCaml. So uh, we actually emphasized the, the idea of language agnostic because we actually want this to be like different pieces that you can abstract as much as possible and you don't have to specialize. Okay, if you actually, if you really need to specialize, then you have to kind of have a compromise. But we are not looking for that. We want to be, to, we want it to be as general as possible. So yeah, we did not look into specializing uh, it for OCaml, uh, for example. Yeah, sure. Yes, that, um, that makes that makes sense. I mean, even if you are interested in trying to be more language agnostic. It, I guess my, my point is more, it seems like kind of a roundabout way of asking the model to fill in a, what should go in the token. Or like, have you looked into prompt tuning at all as a... Prompt tuning? Yeah, the, the approach where you have basically a smaller language model that is stuck on the front of your encoder in whatever language model you're using and you train that. Yeah, uh, again, we, we, we are trying to use models as out of the box as possible. We have the intention of exploring, for example, fine tuning and prompt tuning, but we would like to make use of uh, these new tools as out of the box as possible to, because that increases generalizability. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to specify to any context or scenario as much as possible. We recognize we won't be able to do it every time. Uh, that's why we, yeah, we discuss it, we think about it. For now, we want to avoid it because we would like for some, ideally, some framework that would kind of give you some abstract elements you should have and you can recreate this for your context. Uh, it's not that you have to come up with a new approach or technique every time you have a, a new language, a new platform, a new scenario. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll chat with you after. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Uh, excellent work. Thank um, you. Really excited. I want to use it for a language that we work on. I'm curious about what you think is next because 33% or was it 34? Something like that? Oh, the rate, so... Uh, yeah. This one. The accuracy rate is really impressive, but I wonder what users will think was something that's wrong most of the time. So do you yeah, think yeah. what's next is um, increasing the percentage? Do you think that's possible, or do you have other next steps in mind? Um, we, are, we are especially interested in trying other models just to see if... So this is really interesting because there's something called uh, emerging properties that are things that just showed up in this scaling up of models that you can't actually predict because they show up just because the model scales up, or at least the knowledge so far that we have, we can't predict. Uh, something that usually was done was you had smaller models and you would try to kind of predict how it would evolve if I had a model 10 times bigger, and that would help developers 
know if they should try to build the model that way, but simply bigger. But some things started to happen. That was when models got this big, they started to give generations that could not be predictable. And we are actually curious uh, in uh, using other models, not just because they're bigger, but also because they are trained differently, because we want to see if generations are actually better, worse, better for some things, worse for other things. But especially, we always say we focus on this. It's because uh, we, we actually did several trial and error uh, things, just prompts we tried that would have generally bad results. We curiously happened to kind of stumble upon this, OK, exercise is pretty fun. It, it's, it's able to select an option. So. It, it's like a creativity here. There's a big space to explore. We are especially interested in exploring the part where building prompts. Yes. Thanks. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK. Uh, do we have some more? Yeah. Grab the mic. Yeah, just a follow-up question, because uh, we realize they are still like over half of the benchmarks cannot be solved. So did you like uh, inspect some of these manually to understand you know, why they are so hard for your tool, or maybe including the other two tools, so that they cannot fix such programs and what kind of fe what kind of features or patterns they have shown. Um, not much, uh, honestly. Um, what we noticed is that um, so some of these programs uh, were um, obtained in. Uh, programming classes, and they are going to be really good at exposing uh, common issues uh, when people are either learning or just writing uh, programs. But inevitably, even if the data set is a bit curated, you always have some weirder patterns that you start to question if they are that frequent or not. And those edge cases tend to uh, so be that, tricky. Maybe but some of the benchmarks cannot be fixed, so is that the case? And some of them can, can you repeat, please? Yeah, I mean, some of them cannot be fixed, so is that the case? No, we were not able to. They are fixable. Uh, the tool okay, just so didn't automatically them. generate the patch. Yes, there's a solution. Um, but yeah, we, we, uh, honestly, we didn't look into them mainly because we didn't have resources to manually explore each one of those. Uh, we, we put a considerable effort here because uh, we, we were always stuck on the part where, okay, we have thousands of programs, we generate even more patches, uh, but we need to know how this, this, does this make sense? Is this working? What's the progression? And this was actually a, a lot of work to have this done. The consequence is that we can actually grow the number of things we can analyze. Another consequence is that it's harder to explore the programs that are not fixed. But yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I agree. It's one thing we would like to do. Again, we looked a bit into it. We noticed that edge cases tend to be really tricky, but uh, I would like to, to yeah, comment I, more. But Given uh, that you said that some of these like patterns are maybe only made by programming novices, so maybe no, may, or maybe not. That's yeah, maybe why. That's why I, I'm, I don't want to compromise to commit myself too too hard on this because yeah, yeah, I may it may actually be common hard. and there's a problem with the technique. Yeah. So maybe it's like a open question that still can we have like some benchmark that is more from like the real world programs like the, the real developers they made this kind of type error. So yeah. One, but I know that this is really hard to clap because when you want to conduct. Evaluation is really hard to find some, you know, very fair and open yeah. uh, data set that can actually, you know, really evaluate things. But the student assignment is something that's easier to collect. But yeah, but you know that the results are somehow a bit mm -hmm. biased, right? But it's, you know, it's hard to solve this problem. We, we can only use this as more like a so yeah, uh, yeah, three things. So the focus of all the automated program repair thing is that it's based on something called a. Uh, the, 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 uh, I was trying to remember the phrase exactly, but it's like programmers do one, one thing really well and we never take advantage of it, and it, that's, they tend to write programs that are almost correct. And that's, models are really good 
they are already really good at generating like full programs or almost full programs, but they are especially useful when you have a clear, very uh, well-established idea of what you have and it's actually good at generating the part that's missing, your little fault. Um, second thing is that the programs were obtained from programming classes because the, like, if motivation one was uh, this, motivation zero was that the person that suggested all this was working with students and she noticed that they had lots of troubles with messages from compilers. Uh, she wanted yeah, something to help them. It, it, it wouldn't make. Yes. Okay, so we're getting close to the end of session. I think we'll wrap this question up for now. Is there anybody else who wants to chip in at this point? Okay, right. Well, I don't know if there are any... Oh, right. One more. I think this will have to be the last one today. What, let poor Francis go out from behind the legs and far away. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask if you explored how big the context uh, of this source code should be and does it influence the accuracy of the output. So uh, there are languages uh, not like for Camel that is pretty compact, uh, but uh, like Go for example where you can uh, have a lot of code written in one function and uh, for example, renaming or changing some substatement can uh, be really uh, can, be, can be lost in this huge context. Uh, so, how does the size of the code impact the result? Thank you. Bonus slides. Uh, okay, just to address the question really quickly, uh, th these were some initial experiments. Uh, I won't bug you with details, but this set of programs, it's simple, it's really small. This set of programs, it's bigger. And what you, what you notice is that, um, so really quickly, 87, 53, 87, 60. you increase the complexity of the programs and you get sometimes you get better results. So increased size may mean more context, better generations. Uh, um, in the paper, I also report a bit about the size of the programs. I did not write it down in the slides, so uh, sorry. I can refer to it later, but I uh, don't have the numbers right now on me. Thank you. Okay, lots of interesting large language models. Let's thank Francisco for his marathon question you. session. Thank you very much.